very uh, pleased indeed to uh, introduce Arlan Ahmed, who's, uh, who lives in Slough, but is doing a doctorate in, in Cambridge. And she has been involved in Islamic education for, for 20 years, and, and uh, you know, it, it, it's a very interesting development. I'm just having to refer to my notes here to get the titles correct, but she's just recently been involved in setting up something called the Centre for Research and Evaluation of Muslim Education in the Institute of Education in London University. And she's also involved in Islamic teacher education courses, which is a very interesting thing she, she might mention today. Um, uh, and, and is director of education at the Islamic Shahsia Foundation. So, I mean, a, a number of different kinds of very interesting involvement with Islamic education. And her PhD is what she's going to be telling us about today, which is, as you can see, about uh, exploring Halakha as a research method. <coughs> I should say that um, Farah has to leave really very promptly to get a train. So she'll be, she'll be out the door, definitely, um, <laughs> At just after eight o'clock, um, so I'm going to I'm going to keep time fairly very strictly because of that. Um, there will be time for questions, I'm sure, uh, so that that's no problem. But if if the questions are coming thick and fast and people don't have a chance to squeeze their question in, please um, email Farah. She's very happy to take email questions. Her, her address is in the, is in the booklet here, some copies at the front. So please don't feel that you know you, you, you're shortchanged on on opportunities to discuss with her. But there will be there will be time for questions, don't worry. Just thought I'd better give you a warning that we are going to be finishing very promptly. Great, so um, that's it really. Over to you, Farah. Okay, Assalamualaikum. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you very much to Sophie and everybody else at the Centre here for inviting me to speak about um, the research method I actually used in my Masters. That's what I'm going to be talking about today. And this is, I've put the title, A Tentative Approach to Developing some Islamic research principles and within a critical and indigenous context. So it's really something which is a work in progress and just I'd, I'd be very interested in hearing your feedback on what you think about what I'm saying today. Okay, so what is halakha? There's an image there of a traditional halakha um, capturing often based in the home, in the mosque, in schools, um, the Qutubs, the schools for young children that have been there for many centuries. It's something that you'll see wherever you find Muslims. Um, Halakha is something that we've adapted in the, the primary school I work in, and that's where, that's where the, the interest in Halakha came about. So there's a slide there which is just um, explaining a little bit about the history of Halakha, the fact that it's... it's Credited in some ways that the fact the loose uh, informal educational approaches that were there in Muslim societies and Muslim communities is cr credited to some degree of the transformative nature of Islamic education, the intellectual heritage of Islam, and of all the kinds of um, learning communities that have been developed in Muslim societies, past and present. Um, Formal authority <coughs> can vary immensely. It can be transmission-based, teacher-led, and more and more that's what we're seeing at the moment. That's the contemporary sort of example. But it also can be a collaborative group effort. And the curriculum is open. It's really informal, loose. Anybody can start a hapa halakha. People do it in all sorts of different kind of ways. I think the, the, what interested me particularly is this, the form of teaching that the Prophet used in teaching his companions. And the fact that that is the, the, the approach that he took was something that we thought was quite important. So we began to use halakha in our schools. And I'll show you a little example of that in a little while with quite young children. Um, the example I'm going to show you, I want to contextualize it a little bit because it relates to our topic. Uh, I work in a very small Islamic primary school. We started out as homeschoolers. We have a very alternative ethos. We approach education in a totally different kind of way. I'd love to talk to you more about that, but I can't because of time constraints. But one of the things that we do, uh, we've been doing for about five, six years now, is every year with our 7 to 11-year-olds, we do something called an Islamic Inventions Fair. And what they have is that each year group has a topic, and they have to go out and research. Uh, a Muslim scientist or a Muslim discovery, which is actually quite challenging because unlike books about um, Marie Curie and Michael Faraday, it's very hard to find children's books about people like Ibn Sina or, or Al-Farabi or any of the great Muslim scientists and scholars that there were. 
Um, so the children have to go out and do some research and they have to come back with a 3D model and they have to produce a 2D display which will include some written work, some artwork and the key thing that they have to do is actually do an oral presentation. Then we hold an exhibition which is open to the, to the wider public. So this is something that we've been doing for a long time. We've had a lot of recognition from people like 1000 More Inventions and so on. So the Halakha I'm going to show you, uh, before I come to the Halakha, i just show you a picture of the exhibition so you can see that they're looking at medical development in Islamic heritage. They get to dress up as well, which they, they love doing, and it's a lot of fun. So that's a practical example of, of what you can see of the work that they do. So in the context of the Halakha I'm going to show you, this is a year three class, and their topic at that time was astronomy and the universe. So they were looking at scientific discoveries to do with astronomy and the universe, which obviously is a lot of Islamic heritage for that. And what happened is that um, we, I, I was doing a few halakha with them, and what we, we did a various range of things. We, we spent some time looking at, on the interactive whiteboard, a screen of just the night sky. And they contemplated you know, a black screen with, with stars, and just asked them what they, what, how that made them feel, what that made them think about. Then we looked at a daffodil. And so we had a daffodil in the centre of the halakha and we were talking about the daffodil and what that made them think. We were talking about the concept of the signs of Allah and how Allah created these things and how we're here to discover them and what things you can discover, how you can dissect the daffodil, all sorts of things. So we've, there's a context to the little clip I'm going to show you. They've been doing all this um, work on scientific discoveries. And I'm hoping to get this right because I couldn't manage to edit it to the little bit I wanted to show you, but I will play it and then hopefully stop it at the right time. Uh, okay, I think I need to go back a little bit. So you can see that I'm going to talk about the, to them uh, about now, about science and Islam. This, this topic begins to come up and uh, what I'd like you to see is how the children respond to this, to some of the questions that I put to them. Okay. Some people say that if you believe in a God, then you wouldn't use science. What? That doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. Why doesn't that make sense? Because you're always saying you're doing science. I know, the Christians, they really want to go and they should be scientists. But some people say that if you really want to be a scientist, then you have to, you know, leave God out of it. Because you, if you want to get the real, honest truth about what's really happening, then you don't need to talk about a God. But Allah is the one that helps you do this. But they're saying that if you believe in Allah, you wouldn't study the science properly because you're just saying, oh, I love it, oh, I love it, oh, I love it. Is that what the Muslim scientists did? No. What did they do? Do you think they were thinking about Allah when they did these things? Yeah. Yeah. What makes you think that? Rita, why do you think that? So we'll be able to think about all these things. So somebody doesn't believe in Allah, can't be a scientist. It's not just 
talk about helping people, helping people is very important. What I'm trying to get you to think about is, you know when you have some visitors, I'm sure we have some non-Muslim visitors to us for your exhibition. A lot of people think in this society that believing in God does not go with doing science. They think science is about just, you don't think about God when you do science. That's wrong. That's wrong. Completely. They think that if you just think about God all the time, you wouldn't do science. And one of the things that you're going to show that just doing the exhibition, for the inventions that you're talking about, is by doing it, you're showing that in fact, it's the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's the Quran which asks you this verse in Surah Al-Baqarah and other verses where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, have you not thought about this? Look at the signs in this. Look at the signs in that. And Allah is asking you to think. Okay, let me read some more out. Okay, I'll just stop it there. Um, so you can see it's an interactive discussion and the children are very intrigued by what I'm saying to them and they're thinking quite deeply about it. Um, asking quite a few questions about it as well. So this is an example of halakha, and because it was on the topic of research and science and what it means to learn something and what it means to, to gain knowledge, I thought it would be a good example to show you what, of halakha in action. Okay, so the context of where we're coming from is that Muslims, since the early 1900s, have been trying to work out how to deal with the modern world and how to deal with uh, the situation whereby, in certainly in higher education, but also at a, even at a primary level, the modes of education that exist in the Muslim world are Western-based models. And the European experience of separating out science, knowledge, research, education from religion, which happened over the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, has been imported into the Muslim world and Muslims are trying to engage with this and struggle with it. So just like these children who have this belief because they've been taught about their religion, are, they're quite shocked to find that people have this view. M Muslim researchers, Muslims who are working in a high, a higher education, Muslim scientists even, we struggle with this idea of having a secular based research model and consider what, you know, where, where we fit in with that. And that's the context of what I'd like to talk about. Now, there's a few movements since the 19th century. There's probably many, but I get, get, want to give just very briefly three examples of movements that I've looked at which have tried to address this. So you have the Islamis Islamization of knowledge movement, which was based around um, uh, Ismail al-Faruqi and Naqib al Athas, happened in the 1970s and the 1980s. And that was talking about taking modern knowledge and Islamizing it. Some of you will be quite familiar with this. Um, it has its uh, critics. It has its uh, people who, who are, um, feel that it has failed in many ways. And one of the things that is brought out about this is that methodologically, there is very little work done on how to approach research, how to approach knowledge from an Islamic basis. That what tends to happen is there's a lot of critique of what's happening in the West, particularly in the 70s and 80s when you had the, the whole um, interpretivist and social constructionist models co being, coming out and there was a lot of critique about the positivist and post-positivist models that existed. Muslims were are jumping onto this bandwagon, making that critique, but the point that other people are making is, yeah, but they're not coming up with anything as a response to it. They're not coming up with an alternative. You're talking about Islamized knowledge. What does that mean? How can knowledge be Islamized? How can science be Islamized? So lots of questions around that. You then obviously have the traditionalism movement, which is very popular amongst Muslims, say, for say, Nasser, Guy Eaton, people of that kind of thing, who want to, who see knowledge as something sacred, who see it, a spiritual dimension to it, and feel that losing that spiritual dimension has taken the essence, the human aspect, actually out of knowledge. It's in fact that unlike the humanists or secular people, they believe that without that spiritual sacred dimension, which could be religious, could even be non-religious, knowledge loses its value. <coughs> so they were talking about things like um, the impact on the environment, the impact on, on the world back since the 1960s up until this date. Um, again, it's 
it's talking about having a spiritual dimension to knowledge, but there's nothing really that you can work with or how do you approach that. It's, it, it's a very personal thing. You have what is known as the Ijmali or the transmodernism movement, which is based <coughs> very squarely in the UK with Ziadin Sodar and the Welsh Muslim Meryl Wynne Davis um, and people around that who've been talking about addressing modernism from a, a different perspective. So I, I was looking at these kind of things, that the, the idea that for the transmodernism modernism is that you have a plural, plurality of modernities based from different world views and Islam would be, would be one of the world views that contributes to that. All of these movements, that the criticism of where's the methodology, where's the substance, how do you approach it, okay, th these are grand ideas, these are things that you want to do, those criticisms are there and it's, you, it is difficult to find examples of where those ideas have been translated into something physical, something practical. And I couldn't find very many examples of this either. When I was doing my masters and doing what postgraduate students do, is trying to work out, where, you know, how am I going to approach this study? I was studying the concept of holistic Islamic education in the schools that I work in. What, what am I going to do? This was something that I was wrestling with, and, and this is how I came along with the idea of um, using the halakha as a research method. And where I actually ended up taking inspiration from is interesting enough is something called Kalpapa Maori, which is Maori research loosely translated or Maori forms of knowing, which is based in New Zealand. And there's a scholar, Linda Tuhiwai Smith, who has very famously wrote a book called Decolonizing Methodologies. And I, I, I will actually just read this out to you because I think it, it encapsulates uh, a, a world view which then relates to research. So Kaupapa Māori is the conceptualization of Māori knowledge that has been developed through oral tradition. It is the process by which Māori mind receives, internalizes, differentiates, and formulates ideas and knowledge exclusively through Te Rau Māori. Kaupapa Māori is esoteric and tuturu Māori. It is knowledge that validates a Māori worldview and is not only Māori-owned, but also Māori-controlled. One of the criticisms that Tuhuai Smith makes, is, um, and it's a lovely phrase she uses, um, where she says that research is one of the dirtiest words in the vocabulary of indigenous peoples. That indigenous peoples who have been researched for so long in so many different all kinds of ways that people have run out of things to research about indigenous peoples, for those peoples, the term research, she says, is a dirty word because it equates to exploitation, it equates to colonialism. So she's a Maori scholar trying to address that. So she wants to engage in research, but she wants to do it from her own worldview, her own basis. She wants to, it's a critical approach, an indigenous approach that is there to empower Maori people. So this is done successfully through Te Reo Maori. I don't know the, the essences of all these terms. I just find it quite inspirational. I think it's important that she does use these terms, which are from a different language, because clearly for her, the, the meaning of these terms cannot be easily translated. And that meaning is encapsulating certain concepts which are alien to the Western way of structuring knowledge, whatever kind of Western, uh, inter uh, Western um, paradigm is used. Um, the only language that can access, conceptualize, and internalize in spiritual terms this body of knowledge, this Kaupapa Maori knowledge, is exclusive too. For no other knowledge in the world has its origins in Rangitea. As such, it is the natural and only source for the development of a mechanism which aims to transmit exclusively Kalpapa Māori knowledge. Okay, so how, does, how do you do this? How does this go about? And this is something that what the Māori researchers have done is they've come up with certain principles which guide their research. And these are very broad principles, but those principles are there to lay a foundation, to put some parameters, to have something to draw upon. So they talk about the principle of self-determination. So the Maori people should determine for themselves what is happening to them. Principle of cultural aspiration. They should be able to aspire to their own cultural heritage. Principle of a culturally preferred pedagogy. So this is culturally, culturally relevant education, something similar to what we're doing with our children at the Islamic Conventions Fair, where they're learning about science through an Islamic lens and not seeing science as something that exclusively happened in Europe and doesn't really happen anywhere else. Um, the principle of socio-economic mediation, of 
extended family structure of collective philosophy, the Treaty of Waitingi, which is actually the treaty between the Maori tribes and the British Empire, which they feel gave them some space, some way of controlling their own destiny, and they don't want that to be underlined. And the principle of growing respectful relationships. So I'm not going to dwell too long on this because I've got a lot to cover in very, very little time. So the way I then approached it is that I then thought, okay, if this is the case, then we need some Islamic research principles. Um, a few people have actually done something like this before. Ismail Faruqi put together some principles, but they weren't so much methodological as epistemological or ethical. I didn't find that they were useful to me for construct for setting up, you know, writing up my methods section of my dissertation. Um, there is another scholar in Canada called Jasin Zin, and she's talked about some principles of, of critical faith-based epistemology. But again, I didn't, I didn't think that it was necessarily as useful for me. So I put these principles together. Okay, so I expect a lot of criticism because, you know, what do I know about setting it down a basis for Islamic research? Um, so the first principle would be the primacy of Quran and the prophetic sayings. And I think, as a, for me personally, as a Muslim researcher, if I'm talking about knowledge that means something to me, I can't take that away. Obviously, a non-Muslim would, would think, what on earth is that to do with anything? But for me, it's the Quran is the literal word of God, and those prophetic sayings are there to explain the Quran. It's a revealed text and ultimate guiding force for Muslims. Um, the second research principle is the combining classical Islamic scholarship and sciences with a range of other research methods. Unlike Sardar and Merwin Davis, who critique the methodologies that are there in the traditional Islamic sciences, I can understand their frustrations with it, and I can see that those methodologies are doing very little to help the Muslim community today. Nevertheless, my point is that, that there is a tradition and that tradition was something that generated and flourished and produced very relevant knowledge for centuries, the tradition, to some degree, was interrupted by colonialism. And I don't personally think that you can just start from scratch. I think you have to try and pick up where it left off. So I think there has to be something which you, you're drawing upon, traditionalist methodologies, things like ishtihad, things like the soul of faith, those kind of things which scholars were using to, okay, to understand law, essentially, but within the wider social sciences, adapt that to some, in some kind of ways. And this needs a lot of work, this needs a lot of creativity, a lot of dynamism, but I don't want to throw it out the window and say, let's just start from scratch, and let's just go straight to the Quran and Sunnah. So I think the classical scholarship has got to have a, a, a place to play within this. The third principle is of using all faculties of human understanding. This is what many indigenous researchers um, and qualitative researchers as well, a lot of Western qualitative researchers talk about is that it's going beyond the purely rational, the purely ugly based, to use this uh, Quranic terminology. But going beyond that, and if you're looking at the Quranic concept of akal, intellect or reason, it has a spiritual dimension as, as well as a rational dimension. So that it should faculties of understanding, human faculties of understanding are not just reason based. They're intellectual, they're rational, they're also intuitive and spiritual. There are some feminist communitarians who would agree with this kind of thing as well. So it's just taking away that pure scientific reason based approach to, to knowledge and learning and research. Um, principle of centering the human situation in research. So research needs to be centered around the needs of the human beings, not the needs of the funders or of a government with a particular agenda or so on, something that we all can relate to, we all can see, but that it needs to serve the community that is being researched. Again, that's the principle that the Maori are upholding, and I think that it probably is really good research anywhere would do this but certainly for Muslim community researching Muslims, that it needs to be centering the human situation of the Muslims that you're researching. Islamic ethics and etiquette. We have research ethics. As Muslims, we have our own code of ethics, which we live by. We have a certain adab, or etiquette. I mean, etiquette is not a word that explains what adab is. Um, so uh, bringing those concepts of akhlaq and adab into our research ethics, and research ethics going beyond just ticking off forms. 
which again, all good researchers has, has excellent research ethics. So it's not that it's not there, but it's that it has an Islamic cultural lens or religious lens to it. Um, the principle of collaborative, participative, transformative, and useful research. So research which doesn't just isn't just there for the researcher. Because in Islam, seeking knowledge, we have that concept, isn't it, of iman and action, that there's no iman without amal. You can't, the, the, the belief, the values have to be embodied in what you do. And what you do has to be transformative. What you do with your life has to have an impact. It isn't, you don't do things because it's a job. This is not the ethics of a Muslim. It's not the value system of a Muslim. So research should not be something that you're doing just to get that piece of paper which says that you're now a doctor, you, you know, you're a doctor of philosophy or whatever it is. But that's not the purpose behind it. It has to be meaningful. It has to have an impact. It is, it, it's got to make a change in the community that you're, you're serving. Um, okay, so those are the principles. And this is explaining uh, a diagram to explain how the Islamic research method kind of came about. So yeah, you have on the, the outer circle, you have an interpretivist paradigm. And I felt that that was the only way that I could locate it within something, because it's certainly not positivist. It's interpretivist within an Islamic sense. And there's a two-fold sort of dimension to this. On the one hand, if you're a Muslim reading a research done by a Muslim about Muslims, then you're going to be reading that as a Muslim. If you're a non-Muslim reading it, you're reading it as an interpretation of the social situation by through an Islamic lens. So it, it does kind of serve both purposes, um, and it has a different meaning to, to the two different sets of people. Within that interpretive paradigm, I took a critical theory approach with an awareness of this post-colonial indigenous knowledge perspective that is there not just amongst indigenous communities, but also amongst minority communities, so African-American type approach, which is to crit critical race theory and so on. So that, that's the, the type of approach I took, that it needs to have an impact, it needs to be something that is there to empower the people that are being researched. I then formulated a case study of Islamic Shaksir Foundation schools and the use of holistic Islamic education as culturally, re culturally relevant in, in these schools. It wasn't much point in anonymizing the, these schools for a number of reasons, not least because um, the work that we do there is so different to anywhere else that anybody who works around Muslim schools would, would know where we were straight away <laughs> because nobody else does halakha the way we do, nobody else does the kind of inventions fairs that we do, although some people are now beginning to, to take those, those things on. So bringing all of that together, then the actual research method that I used was halakha itself. Okay, um, so how did this halakha work, the research method that I used? I drew upon various qualitative approaches. So <coughs> we've talked about critical theory. I've talked, uh, another element of qualitative research is reflexive conversation. So the reflexive element. A participative research approach where you have participative action research, a collaborative research, something that is feeding back into what is happening. Narrative inquiry, this is a research method that many people are using, autoethnography. There was an autoethnographic element to this because I was such an insider researcher and I was relating it back to my own experiences of education. So participant empowerment, and I've slotted in with that, of spirituality. Halakha is a spiritual activity. You begin with recitation of the Quran usually, you end with a supplication. Um, the referencing is always to Quran and Sunnah, and it's something that is seen as uh, not, not seeking knowledge is seen as a spiritual activity in Islam. So, for example, when we sit with the children, we, we remind them that there are hadith sayings of the Prophet that when people sit in this kind of way and remember Allah, the angels actually descend and join upon them. And some of the hadith describe the angels sit above the circles and they make supplication for the people who are within that. So it's not something which is just a group of people having a discussion. It has a context which lots of Muslims relate to, and many Muslims would have attended Halakha in all sorts of different formats throughout their lives. Okay, so what I did was, within the school, we took, formulated two groups. One was school leaders. These were founding members of the school, um, people like myself who had started homeschooling our kids, 
and that had grown into a range of groups and then eventually we ended up registering two schools. So people have been in this for about eight to nine years at this point and have been doing it for a long time and had a lot of very strong views about it. So I, I, I took part in that, I, I was part of that halakha and there was a certain topic that we discussed. Then we uh, form, formed another group of teachers who had been in the school for a little while, so sort of 18 months to two years, but were relatively new. Um, most of them had kids in the school as well because a lot of our staff do, but um, some of them didn't. So they were more newer, so just to see what their perspective on, on a range of things was. And they, this halakha I didn't participate in, I just asked them to record it, I, it was actually very open. Um, all I did was give them six topics to discuss, which are there. So, I asked them to talk about their own experiences of education, what motivated them to come to this school for themselves and for their children, and um, their involvement in the school, what it meant to them. But then I gave them these topics and they could discuss any of them or some of them or all of them or how they wanted. Um, as a research method, there was some issue with that because I think I just left it too open. I didn't want to tell them, didn't want to structure them, but I left it far too open. And the first halakha that they had, the group that I was in there, was really interesting because they all talked about their own experiences. And I got some really rich data from there. The second one... Um, but when they talked about their experiences, and th th these lasted about two hours each, second one, they, they sort of decided to have a lovely chat, a staff room chat about their kids in their class and what had happened there and so on. So although they were kind of loosely talking about it, it was, it was really um, not very focused at all. So in the third halakha, I actually gave them some questions that they could then select, and that refocused them back to it. So one thing I learned is that although it's good to be very open in the halakha, it's not... It's not necessarily good to be too open. So there's a lot of topics there, a lot of things that they can um, discuss and their perspectives on things like community and community cohesion, what, what, what it is, on what, do they, what do they think education and identity is, the practice and the pedagogy in the school and so on. I'm not going to discuss the findings because we don't have time to talk about that. There is in a paper which has been published and I, I think it may be in the, the brochure. If not, I can certainly send you the link to it. Um, Okay, so the, in terms of the halakha as research method, which is what, one of my research questions, what did we find? And that halakha is an exceptionally useful method in this specific study, and that's the only thing I'm claiming. I'm not claiming that it's the, the solution to all the research problems in the world. But in this particular study, it was very useful because it allowed participants to open up and share their experiences and, and drew out their own conceptualizations of themselves. Um, it was effective in engaging them in a meaningful dialogue to explore different perspectives. They could discuss very openly with each other, but within a context that they were comfortable in. So it's an ideal medium for collective tafakkur. Tafakkur means thought or reflection, um, and it's a way of having a dialogue so that you come to a deeper understanding of a particular topic. And it's useful in any context where this is important to the research. It's also useful in providing Muslims with an opportunity to be open and express their personal views from their own worldview. Had I used a focus group or a group interview technique and not said to them, look, you can just sit and do halakha, then they probably would have been very cagey about <coughs> giving references to, say, Quran or Hadith or saying, well, you know, this scholar said this, so therefore I think this. But because it was in the halakha format, and that's what they normally are used to, and that's what they do, then they were quite happy to do that. They were happy to discuss without those references, but they were also happy to give that reference, which is what, form, you know, which is what is, is, is the framework by which they live their lives, is the conceptualization of how they view the world. Um, so in any qualitative study of Muslims' ways of seeing, this is invaluable. So reflexivity is important to all types of research. So my uh, um, point would be that even in a large-scale quantitative study, or if you were doing a scientific experimental research, a Muslim researcher, and this would have a meaning, just like the Maori research has a meaning to Maori researchers, for Muslim researchers, you may benefit that as a research group you get together and you do a collective effort to try and seek out knowledge. Going back to the Muslim scientists we talked about, 
it's well known when you when the autobiographies sorry the biographies that are written of their lives that they would spend time in doing tafakkur, doing dhikr. They would spend time, they would if they were struggling with a problem, they would go back and pray and supplicate and ask, make dua, ask for guidance with their work. So this was something that was part of their heritage, part of their culture. This is practice that could be incorporated back into our research approaches as Muslims. And it can give meaning to the research activity by providing an opportunity to work through some of the Islamic research principles that I've suggested in designing and evaluating the research as well as addressing difficulties that may arise during the course of the research. So there's a, there's a ways of using this that can be done quite creatively, not just amongst Muslim women who happen to like doing halakha and so are quite happy to, to participate in it. Okay, so um, that's a reference for the paper in which the findings, some, some of you might be more interested in what they actually said than in the mode of, of researching them. And um, that's it, I will stop there, and hopefully there's lots of time for questions so that I don't have to rush anybody. Okay. Wow, that's really interesting. The, the reference there is in the uh, booklet, which is on the desk in the front, okay, so if you want to take that away and look that up, <coughs> please do. Fascinating stuff. Um, Who's going to kick off the questions? Yes, thank you. I find that um, really interesting. Um, you spoke mostly about how it was a research method for a Muslim researcher. And I was wondering whether there are particular principles or, or anything about the approach that you think would be beneficial for non-Muslim researchers as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that the, this diagram here, I know it went through things really fast, but um, I was just conscious of time. This particular diagram, it does highlight a lot of parallels with non-Muslim research approaches. So I did loads of reading on qualitative research methods and Denzel and Lingley's <coughs> huge handbook, which I'm sure you've all seen, and all the different articles in there. Um, and there, there is a lot of overlap. In fact, even in my uh, ethics section, I, I found my personal views as a Muslim researcher on ethics t had a lot of parallels with um, somebody called Christians who talks about feminist communitarian ethical model as opposed to, it's his words, um, a biomedical science et ethical model. So he, he draws the contrast on, on research ethics from that and I, I could really relate to what he was saying about that in terms of ethics. I could relate to the autoethnography aspect of, of reflection, yes, as you're saying, that in autoethnography when you're basically doing an ethnographic study of yourself, um, what you're really doing is, is taking that research as an opportunity to reflect and understand your own understanding better and therefore improve and gain your understanding. And I think that that's what the Fakrut, the Dabur, these Quranic concepts are essentially about. Um, there's a, uh, I can't recall now, somebody could correct me with this Quranic verse or a Hadith of the Prophet, which is that to know Allah, know yourself. And so to that whole self-reflection and in intuition, which chimes well with practicing Muslims who have a spiritual dimension to their lives, is it helps you to understand the world better, it helps you to understand your place in it, understand what your community is about, understand actually some very difficult issues that we as adults, Muslims living in this society, face. Um, one of the things that we find with halakha with the children is we give them that space to do that. And we give them a safe space to introduce ideas to them. Like, I'm introducing this idea. I don't want them to grow up. They've got, you know, if they carry on going to Muslim schools and then they, they find themselves in university and they're in a class where religion is, you're, they're doing science and they, they mention religion, it's going to be rather embarrassing for them, frankly. Okay, it's, it, that's the reality we, we live in. So I don't want them to be in that situation. I want to introduce it to them that, you know, some people think this. This, and they, they, to them, that, that's wrong. I don't know if you heard that. Completely, you know? <laughs> that's the, to them, that, that, that's, an, that's an entirely alien concept, that why would you need to separate religion and science? Why? In their, in their minds. Because the way they're learning about the world is they're learning it from that, from that basis. Now, some people might think that that's indoctrination of them. It's possible. But then my point is that I'm giving them that alternative view. Um, but I'm also giving them a safe space to say what they think about it, not just keep it to themselves. 
I mean, I've read pieces where um, researchers, um, Muslim researchers, there's a lovely book called Wholeness and Holiness in Education by a lady called Zahra Alzira, and she talks about research paradigms, um, where she talks about her experience as a Muslim, and I could relate to it totally, sitting in a university thinking, okay, this is, this is all fine and well, but this doesn't speak to me. It doesn't, it's not, I have to leave myself over there to be part of this. And that's what we, we do that as adults. So children as they grow up, I think it's our role to support them into learning how to manage that, how to, how to deal with it. Um, just going on from what you just said there, um, about separating uh, knowledge, if you like, from religion, um, and it also came up on, on one, of the, one of the points that you mentioned about having that holistic kind of approach to research, whereby it wouldn't be just rational, beyond rational, spiritual, and intuitive. I mean, I, obviously the spirit of Islam is in line with that, but I mean, you can see why it's contested in the sense that spirituality and uh, intuition is something which is subjective, and because it's subjective, it can't be uh, either validated or refuted by by the community at large, and therefore, in that definition, can't be described as knowledge as such because it can't be shared with, with everyone. It can be a someone's personal belief, and that's fine, but to share that with people on the basis of spirituality and intuition, as opposed to rationale, uh, would be um, so. It's definitely, a critical rationalist would come, come up with that view and say, "Well, this is incorrect because it can't be shared. It might be your knowledge, but it can't be defined as knowledge." In a scientific way. Yeah, there are, there's lots of people who would hold that view, but there's equally people like the Maori people or Native Americans who would say, well, your knowledge doesn't make a jot of sense to me. You know, that might be knowledge that you've got in a university about my community, and it's all fine and well and documented and peer reviewed and re referenced and all of that. There's nothing to do with my life. It, that is just there to exploit what I'm actually about. And so for me, for them, for Mary, it's not just, I don't think this is just something that Muslims would hold. What actually, what's, what is knowledge? Knowledge is something which, is, which I can understand and use and impact. And for, for me, the Quran is knowledge and it has a spiritual dimension and, and it is ilm, that's, that's what it's all about. Um, I can't, for me to, to say, no, I don't want to address that, that's, that's something that is, is, is not, it doesn't sit right with me, and it, it's, it's not, I, I, it doesn't work. And I think that the value that you have here, for social science in particular, this is complicated, because the scientific method, some people have shown, actually came from principles that Muslim scientists put together. Right? So I'm not saying that the scientific method is alien to Islam. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is that particularly in social research, particularly in things like education, or that scientific model, I don't think is doing justice to education per se, or that's my field. I don't know about wider social research in that much depth, but I suspect. All the, a lot of the education research, when you talk to educational researchers, what is it feeding into? It's feeding into some standardized, target-driven, capitalist, business-minded model, which is destroying the really good work that educators are doing up and down this country educators who, in classrooms, are using intuitive knowledge to take a child further in their learning. Intuitive knowledge to make sure that the, that child has emotional support when they're needed. That's a type of knowledge which, why do we devalue that in our society? Why don't we value that knowledge as something which is having an impact? Why, why can it not be called knowledge when it's to do with human relationships and it's to do with how we understand each other? So that's the question I would put back. Um, yeah, sort of following on from that, do you find, um, I mean obviously spirituality you know, is something that scares yeah. a lot of people, so that, that, but not even going there, do you find that with principles like collaboration, participation, action research, what is the response from institutions? who are funding, who are, you know, who actually make research possible. Oh, how, how do you find that works out? <laughs> I don't have a huge experience, you know, experience of that myself, so to draw on, but the fact that there is such a broad field out there of qualitative research methods and people are doing 
um, all sorts of performance research now and, and, and various things in the arts and so on. And presumably they're getting funding for it. So I think that um, if you take the religious element out of it, I don't think it's that much of an issue. The religious element in it, I don't know. I don't know how that would work. Um, I don't know. If, like I said, qualitative research, which has these kind of elements, some of the things I've drawn on in, in this diagram, there is, there's a lot of it going on, so they must be getting funding to be doing it. Uh, but what I'm proposing is probably relatively new. So. No, but I, I, I did want to ask a question, but I also wanted to just pick up on that mm -hmm. last point, is that I think that that methodological reflection may be going on as a byproduct of other things that are deemed to be perhaps more vulnerable or exciting, you know what I mean? And so this kind of work is happening around perhaps the edge of other work that's yeah. going on. But I, what I wanted to ask you about was the kind of the auto-ethnographic mm -hmm. dimension of your mm -hmm. work. And, you know, if, that, if that's going to be a subheading in your methodology chapter, what's going yeah. to sit underneath it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, well, I, well what happened was that one of the things that came out in these halakha um, is it was fascinating how many of the women who, who were involved in this project, of these primary schools, um, had terrible primary education experiences themselves and how many of them were actually immigrated into the country in their primary years, which is my experience. So I came to this country when I, was, I wasn't quite six and went straight into school, as you do. And I spent a good three, four years just totally lost. Uh, and, and, you know, that was, just, that was just what it was. That's how it was in those, day, those days. It was quite a, 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 um, an English area. It wasn't somewhere where there's a lot of other Pakistanis. Um, and um, so many of them had similar kind of experiences. And then as, as you go through school, uh, so in terms of the auto-ethnographic example, uh, I was in Brent and I went to the only girls' school in Brent. I used to take a bus three miles and the, the girls' school was obviously packed with all the Muslims and the Hindus and the Sikhs in Brent, right? So there was like, there's a lot of us. Um, and our lovely, well-meaning teachers were really, really concerned back in the day, as they are now, of this whole um, you know, arranged marriage thing. So we used to, we were subjected to these debates almost every Every few months, every term, there would be a debate on arranged marriage, okay? And I remember the teachers sort of not getting it. And I'm not just talking about the Muslim girls here, but the, I remember the Hindu ones as well, the Sikh ones saying, well, you know, we haven't actually got an issue with this. It's not like you, you're being forced into anything. So you're being introduced by your parents, so what's the big deal? And it's fine, our parents, they care about us, and they're not going to do anything that we don't really want and what you know and the teachers were just sitting there thinking why can't we liberate you you know you need to be liberated right? and, and I remember that, that that kind of experience and and my colleagues although you know I knew them quite well but I didn't realize that they they would all had similar kinds of experiences and they didn't want that for their own kids that's not what they wanted they didn't want their kids going into school and being somebody else and coming home and being somebody else which is what we did we did that for years it was just automatic um, I think for a lot of people in my generation, you, there was a turning point at university where you, you suddenly realized, no, no, actually, I just, you know, you had the confidence just to be yourself. You'd begin to practice, you started to cover, you, you were praying, you were quite happy to say that to people. Whereas before that, you'd be not a damn dream saying something like that to someone because you'd just be too embarrassed. So that, that's something that I suppose the autoethnographic came out in that is that it was very much a, a process of seeing that kind of how much that actually had an impact on you. You don't realise till you think about it. You don't realise why you're doing what you're doing until you sit back in a halakha type situation and you're discussing with each other and you're thinking, okay, well, that, 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 that's a big motivating factor. We don't want the kids to have that uneasiness that, is, that comes with leading a double life, essentially. mentioned you went into the school that you're involved in mm -hmm. for several years um, and so you mentioned as well the auto ethnographic aspect you know how the biographies of yourself and all the other teachers kind of impacted the way in which the schools run but how did you deal with the kind of the the wake and the repercussions of going into this environment where you have close personal friendships mm -hmm. and ties but as a researcher rather than as a teacher or as a um, as a member of the organization or a friend or so um. 
I, you know, it, it wasn't really that much of an issue for me. I, I remember sitting, sitting there in the Holocaust taking part and thinking to myself, don't, you mustn't say stuff, let them speak, let them speak, you know, don't, don't say anything. Um, and I did, I did manage to keep quiet, which um, was, was, I was quite proud of myself. But um, it wasn't really that much of an issue. It was just giving space and time and a recording and transcripts to things that we probably would have done quite naturally in lots of ways, particularly the, the halakha I was part of, because we were school leaders, with these kind of things come up. I mean, there's a lengthy discussion in, in one of the halakha about uh, child-centered play in early years and trying to see where the regulations meet Islamic concepts about educating very young children. And there, there was a point, the, the thing with the I don't know how many of you know about much about the education system in this country, but it, it, it's it's sort of subject to these fashion things that go on there. You got, I mean, Michael Gove is, is you know, I don't know what kind of fashion he's on at the moment, but it's fa it's it's his. It's whatever is in his head is going to become, you know, schools across the country are going to have to do it. So at that point, the whole issue of you do not interfere with the child's play was so heavily a, 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 an aspect of early years that. We certainly felt that children are not learning through this kind of play. Although in Islam, there's an actual hadith saying that you let children play till they're seven. So they should not have formal education till they're seven. Right? So there's an Islamic ruling on this, but we felt that this is just getting silly because you're not, there's no space for the adult to intervene or to take their play forward and make it a meaningful learning experience. So we're having this quite lengthy discussion about it. I think what the halakha gave us time to do is, whereas probably we'd have rush that in a meeting for 10-15 minutes we're saying okay we're sitting here now having a halakha about it we've got time to talk about it and it actually gave it more depth or what what does this mean where's the does the char child's autonomy in this where's the teacher autonomy and how, how does that work and how does it play out and it was a very interesting discussion and the transcripts of it are very telling of, of the different perspectives that came out yes um with the participants knowing that a particular hyper was part of your research. Did, did, did you see any difference then between like what they would say in the halakha there as if it one that wasn't part of your research? Um, you know, up until that point, we didn't actually used to do staff halakha. Uh, everybody, most of our teachers attend some sort of halakha outside. And for those of you in the Muslim community, you'll know that there's there's like every shape under the sun that like, halakha. Some are literally you just sit and read Quran and it's a translation or you're just reading and it's the Jew, then they call that halakha and others are much more sort of okay let, we want to discuss a, a problem let's bring up a social issue and how to do we as Muslims deal with it. So there's a huge range but we didn't actually have halakha for teachers in that format. We actually, one of the things that came out of it is we started doing that uh, as opposed to sort of St you know, staff bonding time, if you like, we began to do that. I think that what I saw in the teachers' halakha, I mean, I wasn't there. Initially, they were all, you know, the, the usual thing of um, they were very hesitant to begin with and so on. And then when, when they got into it, they, they were very relaxed. And um, I think they forgot that they were being recorded and so on. And, and like I said, they digressed quite a bit and so on, and then they'd come back to it. But, um, yeah, so I don't think it was... I mean, I, I could be wrong, but I don't think it was such an issue there. But what I think what I did get from it is, was what was a research you'd call very rich data. That definitely came out, is that you had so much, so many things that I was, you know, n not work, trying to work out which was the most important. Was And I, I've done one paper on the findings. I've, I've actually done a paper on, on this, this presentation today which is under review at the moment. And there's a third paper that I want to draw from, from the masters, which is about the, their personal, their narratives of their lives, their biographical narratives that, um, that I've sort of half done. I'm, I'm working on that at the moment. So from one master study to get three papers shows you that there's quite a lot of data there that, that, that the method facilitated in, in, in coming out. Cuts. I just want to ask a question about, about critical reflection on your research really. mm -hmm. because I mean, it's all really fascinating and I, and I, and I just absolutely see the potential of Halakha as an Islamic research method. I, I slightly raised my eyebrows when you put up your findings slide and you said your first finding was that you found that Halakha was a pretty good yeah. research method. And I thought well, there was a slightly circular logic mm -hmm. to that given that you started off from a faith position mm -hmm. that Halakha's 
halakas were, were used by Prophet Muhammad, therefore, you know, this and Islamic justification for halakas. So, I, 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 perhaps you could talk about that a bit. I mean, you know, would it have been possible to reach any other conclusion other than that halakas was a really good research method? Um, I think if it hadn't worked in the sense that, the, when I put the findings up for this, that was for the third question in my research question. So the first two were more about the topic of Islamic education, identity, and so on. And the findings for that are not mentioned in this presentation. So there were, I think that's what you have to, to sort of see, is that those findings, that's something that came out of the, the, the data that the Halakha generated. And what I'm saying for the, uh, to answer the third question is that in that context, to get that kind of information and to be able to do that level of analysis of it, it was a really good method for getting that kind of information. So that if I'd done a focus group and given, you know, it, 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 and it had been an, an environment which was, it was alien to the, to the participants, then they may not have opened up in that, that kind of way. They may not have been as comfortable talking about things in from their world view they may well have tried to explain themselves with using a different type of language which would have given different type of data okay so in that sense the third research question now which is is, is this halakha useful i mean for, from this study i thought it was uh, like i said how far that would translate elsewhere i don't know so if you took a different group of like for example something like you were doing about parenting if you took a group of muslim parents who perhaps don't necessarily not all of them may have attend halakha or so on and you try to do that with them and all do a group interview it may not work as well um, i don't know but um, i think in this instance in a community where they're familiar with it it, it did it did work very well Probably not much time left, given that the taxi's on its way, but uh, anyone want to squeeze in the last one? Go on then, I'll look a second one. Um, this is a short question. I was just wondering, when you describe this halakha, I would more instinctively, kind of, from my kind of reading and what I've read, think of a shura. Mm -hmm. Was there any reason you chose halakha as the third and not shura? Um, shura is you, you're taking advice on a particular topic, isn't it? You, you, you're asking a question which needs to be answered. This was more an open-ended type of discussion about trying to understand how, understand our own practice. So in, in a way, it's, it's practitioner research. Okay, so it's practitioners reflecting upon what it is that they do and why that's effective or why it's not effective. And that's essentially what the teachers did, which is different to Shura. So Shura would be if, if I go into the staff room and or, you know, we have a meeting and I say, okay, well, there's this new regulation, how do we tackle that? Then they would give me their perspectives on it and then that, that, that's one way of moving forward. I think this is a slightly different thing to that. Okay, well I think we've got to wind it up. It's been a really interesting uh, hour. So let's thank... Um Just to remind people before you disappear that we've got another talk next Tuesday, Dr. Leo Masavi, who's talking about um, Muslim converts. <coughs>